Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Nice to be back here on the Adobe channel. Beetlejace here, Jason Levine, and thank you for joining me today on this lovely, slightly cloudy in the desert Monday for Audio 101 Part 13, uh, how to master your audio and um, how to perform mastering operations on your audio files, whether you're mastering for um, Spotify, iTunes, you know, sort of commercial music only, or just sort of mastering finished audio for a video project or film or anything of that nature. Uh, I'm going to basically take you through some of the workflow techniques and tips and show you the steps involved. And again, this can apply in any DAW. Now, there's no absolute here. There's lots of different ways to do things. And I'm going to just give you lots of those different options and you can kind of figure out the rest um, to see what best suits the type of material you're working with. Yes, we've discussed all different types of DAWs on here, and while I use Adobe Audition primarily, of course, because I am Adobe, um, again, this, this same concepts can apply virtually in any DAW, so whether you're working in Audition or Pro Tools or Logic or wherever, um, the techniques and the processes, and in fact, some of the plugins that I will likely show you, uh, you can use in any of those. All right, so I'm going to, uh, I think we should just get started here. Oh, sorry, I got some of my eye. Get started here and we'll, we'll cover a couple of different types of uh, music and um, you'll sort of get an idea of some things to look out for before you begin mastering. So as always with my audio one-on-ones, I like to be very thorough and kind of show you all the various steps that are involved. Now, um, maybe it isn't obvious, I was going to say obviously, Maybe it isn't so obvious. So mastering is like many things in music, mixing, audio, illustration, painting, you know, whatever. It's an art form. It takes a very long time to learn. It takes a very long time to get it right. And um, there's lots of different ways to do it. So don't get discouraged if, you know, you've tried to master, you've tried to do things and it just kind of didn't work out or you thought, okay, I'll stick, you know, some limiters on this and make it loud and that should be perfect and then it doesn't quite sound the way you want. It takes time and it takes a lot of um, trial and error and it takes a lot of failure to make something that's super successful sounding in the end that kind of sounds good anywhere and everywhere. And as I've mentioned many times talking about just mixing audio in general, having a good listening environment is key for mastering. And of course, I'll be doing everything here in headphones because I have to monitor myself while I present for you. You know, not not the best idea for mastering, right? Um, primarily because today, when we are mastering our audio, we deal a lot with sub, right? Subwoofer, sub frequencies, and sort of controlling bass in a different way than we even did five years ago. And while your headphones can give you a fairly good representation of bass and, and low frequency information, um, it's not going to be as accurate as a good loudspeaker with a good subwoofer. Or even if you just have stereo near field monitors, something that's giving you a, a true representative bass. It's very easy to get lost um, with bass frequencies and headphones, even if you know them very well. So, not that you can't do it, but just keep in mind that it's not really a recommended practice. And for certain, Mastering in things like earbuds and stuff. I mean again, you can do it. It's not that you can't it's just that It just makes it a little bit more difficult because what you're hearing through said earbuds is not going to be necessarily Representative of what it would sound like anywhere elsewhere So uh, let's start Let's start what we came here to do. That's fella could do circa 1971 let's go and start with amplitude statistics because before you master, before you do anything, um, as I've said many, many times, ad infinitum here, very good to understand and know what exactly is happening in your audio. And the best way to do that is to launch the Amplitude Statistics panel. Now, again, you will not see this specific panel in other DAWs necessarily. If you are in Audition, and I recommend you try it, um, Amplitude Statistics can be found under the window menu. And when you scan your audio. This is going to tell you basically everything you need to know um, as it relates to the pre-mastered mix. So, you know, again, I won't cover all of this because we've talked about it in many things, but this is actually, this panel is very good and absolutely necessary for mastering, particularly when you're done, right? When you're delivering the audio, because then you can deliver with confidence knowing all of the subsequent measurements and attributes of this file before you hand it off to someone. 
uh, or to an organization. So if, for instance, me, I'm a, I've got a lot of stuff on Spotify. So before I deliver my finished WAV files, I want to make sure that there's no clipped samples, that there's, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you get the idea. So this panel tells you everything you need to know. First and foremost, peak amplitude. So this mix, which is not mastered, um, has a peak on the left of minus two, about minus 2.3, and it's peaking at, at uh, zero on the right. And I think I saw that here. It looked like a little transient, like a one hit transient or something. Where is that? I saw it a second ago. Oh yeah, right here. So this could be like the vocal coming in, or maybe it's a, uh, a little snare hit that got away from the compressor. Not a big deal. Um, you know, we may do a little bit of normalization before we start processing this. We might take a listen and fix that one hit just to even things out a bit. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. That's a good technique to, to, to use. Um, but again, this is kind of giving us the overall here. Now, because of that one little peak right there, what you'll see is that hitting zero dB caused the true peak amplitude to um, reflect a figure above zero, not uncommon, especially as we approach the, the final um, three to six dB at the top there, but also cause a clipped sample. So again, this is easily fixable. Um, we haven't even mastered yet, so it's not a big deal, but these are the kind of things you wanna know. Um, all of your RMS averages, you can see them here, sort of what the maximum RMS is, the minimum. This is also going to give us an idea by looking at these about the dynamic range. And then you've got your final loudness here measured in loudness units relative to full scale. Now, as I've said many, many times, uh, if this was going out to broadcast television or streaming networks, i.e. Uh, Netflix, Hulu, um, this figure is way too hot for that. Uh, the measurement for LF LUFS in the US here, based on the ITUR BS 1770-3 standard, is minus 24. So, um, but we're not mixing for TV or for, or for, um, for Netflix here. We're, we're, we're mixing just for audio, for Spotify, for iTunes at the moment. I'll show you some of those other things in a minute. So this panel, Amplitude Statistics, is the first place you want to start. Now, as I mentioned, because we can see that little sample right there, probably a good idea just to give it a listen, because if it is something that can be just attenuated uh, a couple of dB, then everything's just kind of even. And actually, that one hit could, in fact, throw off... Uh, any kind of mastering compression or multiband compression and just cause, eh, you know, a little sonic anomaly that we don't necessarily want. So let me go ahead and let's listen to this. Take a quick listen here. Okay, and as, as I guess, it is just like a snare hit. And it actually sounds like he's going, Psh! so he's hitting the snare and the hi-hat and just in that one... That, you know, few milliseconds right there, that little attack transient snuck through whatever compressor they had on there and caused this little peak to kind of hit zero. So one thing that I like to do, um, again, you don't have to do this. I just find that, to be honest, there's, sonically, it's not going to make much of a difference. And um, it can kind of help in the mastering phase is you can actually just grab that peak. You can take a look here. Now, you can see we're zoomed in. These squares that you're seeing there represent um, sample level. So we're all, all the way down at sample level. One of the things that I love about uh, mastering and editing and audition is the speed of the editing interface. I show this all the time. So I'm using my uh, magic mouse here with finger gestures. I can zoom all the way out, you know, in a second and all the way down to sample level. I mean, just ridiculously quickly, all right? So that's where we are there. So let's go ahead and zoom back in. And I'm just going to grab this little peak here. And I'm going to grab the on-clip amplitude uh, uh, panel right here. And I'm just going to drop this around minus 3. And you'll see it'll probably pop back up a little bit. You can see now it's not squared off. It's not flat, which means that that peak is not destroyed. You know, traditionally with digital audio, if you've got something that's gone above zero, it's just noise. But because we are working actually in 32-bit float, uh, that's not going to be a problem for us. We can actually restore and repair those peaks. Now that brings something to mind here before I actually even do that. Um, this particular file is actually a 16-bit wave. Now, while you're processing an audition, everything is happening in 32-bit float. Um, what it'll actually do when you're performing operations on a 16-bit file is it'll, before it applies those processes, it'll convert to 32-bit, apply those processes, and then reconvert back down to 16 because the native 
bit depth of this is 16. Um, that's fine, kind of kind of silly to sort of do it that way. So now, if you were coming off of, uh, I don't know why they mixed these down to 16-bit before mastering, basically threw away a lot of good bit depth there, kind of like going from a 12, 10 or 12-bit 12 video um, you know, raw master down to an 8-bit. I don't know why you would do that, but I didn't mix these. So one of the things you can also do, and you want to make sure that when you are mastering your final mix, um, you want to be in 32-bit float. So we're going to convert the sample type here. So we're going to keep the sample rate the same. This is 44. Again, I typically record in 48. No point in converting up, by the way. All of your traditional uh, um, means for um, delivering audio, Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play, whatever, they're all broadcasting out at 44. That is still the CD audio standard. So for music, it's fine being in 44.1. We'll keep it in stereo. Now for bit depth, we're actually going to go up to 32-bit float. That is the native working bit depth of Audition and most DAWs today. You'll see you can also go to a straight 24-bit um, uh, packed integer type 1 if you want to do that. I would recommend just going to 32. And this is just going to ensure that we are in 32-bit float the whole time. Uh, uh, all the processing and things that we do, we're really working in a 24-bit space, and those extra 8 bits are just for rounding and all the other things that we're doing and processing, so again, that we can fix little clips and things like the one that you see there. So now that we're in 32-bit, let's go back and fix that little click that we just saw there moments ago. All right, we'll do the same thing here. I'm going to zoom in. And again, you can see that it has exceeded uh, 0 dB. We know this because Amplitude Statistics told us. Let's go ahead and drop this around 3.3, all fine. Again, if this were squared off, this would have told us that that signal was completely destroyed. But because we are working in 32-bit float, usually if those attacks are anywhere from approximately you know, 0.1 to mm, 10 to 12 dB above zero, um, you're usually going to be okay, particularly if they're just short attack transients. If you've got, you know, like, you know, horns or something, or something sustained, ah, uh, probably not, all right? It's, you know, short attack transients, easy to repair. Long, legato, distortion, uh, distorted sections, not so much, all right? You're kind of asking a bit much. So, now that we've done that, let's rescan the file. And what you'll see is that now we've just recovered about a dB and a half there. Um, there's probably one other peak, too, that's a bit hot, but it's not going above zero, so that's fine. And in fact, it actually is this one. We could probably even continue to attenuate this a bit more. I'm one of those people who, when I see that, I'm like, oh, I can get that down another dB. Darn it. So I usually will go back. <laughs> it actually could be these two right here and attenuate them a little bit just because I'm that OCD about certain things. And sometimes you don't even recover much, but I'm going to go for it anyway. All right, let's see. I'm just kind of giving a visual here to see if I missed any peaks. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> and a 0.2 dB. That's fine. Now, again, I'm only doing that because I'm just nuts. Um, you could, in fact, if you wanted to, just normalize the whole thing down, which is another thing that I will often do before I begin mastering, if something is really, really hot. The reason for that is just to give yourself a little bit more headroom as you approach effects. There are really three things that you're doing when you're mastering. You're first of all trying to even out the dynamics of everything. Again, kind of glue everything together just a little bit more. So make it a little bit more consistent. Oftentimes you'll apply something like a stereo widener. And I showed this now last week when we were talking about uh, some of my favorite effects and things. We have this stereo expander here just to make things a little bit bigger, a little bit wider in stereo. So glue it together, homogenize it a little bit more, make it a little bit wider, make it a little bit brighter Okay, so a little, a little bit more clarity, and that again is where we would implement a bit of um, equalization. So I will typically turn to something like our parametric EQ. You'll probably see us today uh, go into something like one of my favorite VST EQ plugins. And then of course the final stage is just to make it louder, right? And that, that is in fact legit and part of the reason for mastering, right? To make it louder. We don't want to mix everything up to zero because you want some of that dynamic range. You want a little bit of space. You want a little bit of breathing room um, to master, to apply more effects to this. Otherwise, it's going to sound really, really squished, right? Really, really overly compressed, 
overly limited. You know, you can adjust loudness based on the style of music and to your liking. Um, I tend to not go super crazy with loudness because I don't like to listen to things that way. But if you are mastering something, you know, and want to make it sound modern and sort of competitive with the things around you, you got to kind of conform to a bit of the, the modern day standards, which is to really push things very, very loud, very, very hot. And this involves using a series of different multiband processes, which I'm going to show you now. So once we've got sort of the, the uh, uh, statistics analyzed and we kind of know what we have to work with, now we can begin the process of actually applying effects. Now, this particular track is sort of a, a rock, rockabilly uh, or hellbilly song, as uh, Chip would tell you. Uh, again, from Chip Hanna and the Berlin Three, and uh, this record will be coming out a little bit later this year. And just take a couple seconds, just take a quick listen to this uh, pre-mastered, and this will give you an idea of what it sounds like. And also pay attention to the level meters here on the right. It's got acoustic bass, okay? So you gotta listen unmastered first. Why is that important? Well, because we're not dealing with like a picked electric bass that's got a lot of attack. We're dealing with an upright acoustic bass, which just from listening to this, um, it's a decent recording, but it's a bit it's a bit thick, it's a bit warm, and there's not a super amount of attack there, So, which also means I'm not hearing a lot of kick drum. Now you'll notice over in the frequency analysis here, let me turn off this hold position that I've got there. Um, you've got a couple different ways that you can display this. I generally don't use the bars. I like to have lines uh, uh, used here. All right, just gives me a little bit more detail. Also, if you twirl down advanced, you can adjust the FFT size to once again, give you a little bit more detail. Um, in your frequency analysis here. Again, we're looking at frequencies linearly uh, from zero to, in this case, 22K along the bottom, along the horizontal axis here. And then you've got your amplitude uh, along the uh, vertical axis here, okay? So you can really see where the bulk of your sound is, where things are resonating. If you were to have, say, you know, uh, a very low frequency hum or rumble, you can kind of see it here. If you had some kind of high pitched whistle or whine, which sometimes comes off of different mixing consoles or by using certain pedals, right? If you've used a guitar with a particular kind of um, distortion pedal or stereo expander pedal or, or compression pedal, a lot of times those pedals can give off a particular kind of noise. You can actually see it in the frequency analysis. You can also, of course, see it in what we refer to as our spectral frequency display, which you can also learn more about in one of my previous Audio 101 lessons. So let's uh, go into our effects rack and we're going to start um, with, now again, you've got a couple of different ways that you can do this. Now I mentioned first and foremost, you know, um, homogenizing everything, gluing things together. So this would typically, typically involve bringing in a little multiband compression. Now, while you wanna compress things, there's also the element of equalization. And a lot of people ask me, well, do you EQ before you compress or do you EQ after? Well, here's the thing. So let's pull up our multiband compressor. And I'll, I'll go with the native one first here just because all of you can access this in the app, particularly if you're downloading Audition for the first time. So much like all the other compressors that I've shown you here, and I think I covered this one in the compression lesson as well, this is no different than the standard single band compressor, and you can see they are all of the traditional settings, threshold, gain, ratio, attack, release. Um, the only difference, of course, is that you have four separate bands that you're controlling uh, with specific frequency ranges. So this first compressor is only affecting zero to 137 hertz, and you can adjust these crossovers simply by clicking and dragging. This is really very similar in all multiband compressors. It's, it, they may look a little bit different, but the functionality of them is virtually the same. Um, Waves makes a whole series of them. C4 is a very, very popular multiband compressor that's been used on countless um, pop and rock records and stuff. So uh, they all kind of function the same, slightly different UIs perhaps, but the concept is the same. So the first band here controls basically all of your low frequency information and some of your low mids. Then we've got the kind of actual mid range here from 138 to 1140 hertz. Okay, that's this band. Then we've got 1140 to around 7K, right? That's kind of your high mids. 
And then 6900 hertz and above, that's all of your high frequency information. So you've got a separate compressor for each of those ranges. And the reason for that is this allows you to kind of tame and again, kind of even out some of the dynamics um, by frequency band in your recording. Now, if you compress it first and then EQ, totally legit. Remember, of course, when you're compressing, if there were something that you didn't like, if something were like overly bassy or overly bright, well, you're affecting the sound of that as you compress it. So sometimes it's necessary to do a little bit of EQ just to roll off a little bit of those unwanted things. And actually, that's what we're going to do here because this track, it's a little warm for my taste. Let's just take a listen again here somewhere in the middle. Yeah, see, and there's not a heck of a lot of high end on this. So I, I really wanna, I just wanna give it a little bit more before we apply the compression. So I'm actually gonna drop the compressor down to the second slot here, and we'll go into EQ. Now, again, you could use something like the parametric EQ here, or you could use one of your favorite uh, VST plugins. Now, I will often turn to something like my SSL EQs. Um, I just did a whole lesson on that, so I'm going to go with the native ones today and we'll use our parametric. A lot of people ask, can you use uh, a graphic equalizer or do you have a preference? I don't generally use graphic EQs, but sure, any kind of equalizer will do it for you. Remember that with something like a graphic, the more bands you have, the more sort of granular control you have. So if I were to use something, it would definitely be at minimum a 20 or 30 band. Keep in mind though, a lot of times some of the uh, uh, smaller um, or limited band graphic EQs the specific frequencies they've set there are because those are really the most musical or they apply to kind of the most common frequencies that you want to boost or cut. So that doesn't make them bad. It just depends on what kind of control do you really need. I'm going to go with the parametric EQ. Yes, Exciter plugin. Don't even know if Audition. So Audition does actually, since you just mentioned it here and we are in Twitch, so um, I, I tend to uh, go off on little tangents occasionally. Um, under special, you'll see uh, something called mastering. Now, I'll be completely honest. I don't recommend using this effect for mastering. I do not. I don't. I don't like the sound of this effect. I can't. I can't mask my feelings on that in any way. Um, it's okay. It's a. It's a. It's a three band EQ, and then you can see it's got a little bit of mastering reverb, a stereo widener, a loudness maximizer, a maximum, uh, an output gain setting, and then an exciter, okay? So Audition does have a native oral exciter built in. Um, for those unfamiliar with what an exciter does, traditionally exciter came out of the analog days where when you'd have analog tape, as you played the tape back and forward and back and forward, you were effectively degrading all of the high frequency information every time you played back and rewound and recorded and rewound and played back and over and over again. That's a fact. So they came up with something called an oral, A-U-R-A-L, oral exciter, which basically using um, un, uh, har distorted harmonics could recreate some of the bright, crisp top end that you would uh, uh, lose over time based on sort of tape degradation. So it used, the, it used again, sort of distortion to kind of recreate these things. Well, you know, digitally, <laughs> we don't lose high frequency information when we play something back a million times. We don't, we don't lose anything. You might lose it if you've gone to a lossy format, something like MP3, but it doesn't degrade over time, right? If you go to a lossy codec, it degrades it and that's that. Again, you play that MP3 a million times, the sound of the MP3 never changes. Whatever you lost or what was lost at the export is forever lost. So a couple of years ago, you started seeing exciters being brought into the digital domain. Um, you know, some people like to use them. I, if, if the recording is done well, it can be used for effect. It just, when you think about it, there's, you're, you, you don't really need to sort of recreate high frequency if it's been lost because it's not getting lost um, because of the format. You know, analog tape, by nature, that happens. High frequency rolls off. Digitally, that doesn't happen, but it can be used for effect. It can give a certain nice effect. And actually, I will say this, on vocals, particularly background vocals, a little exciter can be very, very nice and very effective for really giving them a bit more of that airy, breathy 
kind of sound sometimes, uh, depending upon the style of music. So that's where you find our native exciter. So let's get that mastering effect out of there. Okay, so back into Parametric EQ, we're at 935. And again, thank you so much for joining me. I am Jason Levine, AKA Beetlejace. Please be sure to follow me on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Beetlejace for more audio, video, imagery, and general nerdy stuff around all of those topics. Let's go ahead and take a listen. And as I'm listening, I'm going to start to find some of those frequencies that I don't like and just do a little bit of cutting and boosting. And really the first area that I want to fix is that kind of low, those low mids where there's a bit, a bit of muddiness and just, it's a little too thick. So let's take a listen here and you'll see me start kind of sweeping through things and cutting some things, all right? And boosting others, take a listen. Don't you know? So we'll go and start with around 200. Now you can really hear that's it's pretty muddy right there, right? Now we're getting a lot of resonance right there at around 244. This is a pretty wide band though. But that's because I'm just doing a little bit of pre-mastering EQ. Okay, so before, after. All right. Let's see about bringing in a little bit more of that uh, little smack of that snare and things. Everything a little bit of a lift. Okay, using a little bit of high shelving there. Maybe we'll stick just a little bit of the bass. See, uh, you can hear it as it went around 73 hertz. I just didn't, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, I wish I could go back and remix some of these. Just because uh, the, the bass, it's, he's playing such a cool line and it's just not quite as defined as I would like. But this is one of the things that you're dealing with when mastering. We don't have, I don't have the multi-tracks. I can't remix the bass line. And let me just say that for a minute here. I've said it before, I shall say it again. All right, we throw the term remix around. We even have a function in Audition called remix. Remix at its most fundamental nature means to go back and mix again, i.e. from the multi-track masters. Separate bass, separate drums, separate vocals, separate guitars, separate whatever, right? So we say remix a lot today. We say it with photography. Hey, it's a remix. It's a bunch of images thrown together and showed in a different, uh, different order, right? Remix takes a song and will take, you know, the, the chorus and the verse, and you can move them around and re dynamically sort of recompose. But you're not, you're not mixing the elements, right? You're remixing a finished stereo file or a finished mono file or whatever. Because I don't have the multi-track, I can't really do much to the bass here, but I can tweak it enough just to kind of, before I start uh, adding compression and limiting, give it a little bit more clarity and just overall kind of give this track a little bit more, right? I'm not doing a, a, an extreme amount of boosting and cutting here, just enough so that when it goes into the compressor, I've got a little bit more to work with. And that's why I just added a little boost at around 73, because that's where that a lot of those fundamental bass notes were kind of plunking through a little bit more clearly. So with a little bit of EQ here, let's just play it again. Actually, start at the beginning. So first, we'll start without the EQ. Okay, sounds good. It's just very warm. Now let's play it again, and I'll kick the EQ in. All 
All right, I can, I can even probably make this a little bit wider, all right, just to bring out a little bit more of the adjacent frequencies. Again, I'm not trying to change the thing, and it's, it's subtle, and you're hearing my fan noise. I don't know how well this is coming through on stream. It's just enough to kind of give it a little bit of a lift before we begin applying compression, okay? Once I've done that, now we can go into our multiband compressor, okay? And this is where things start to get really cool, because this is going to allow you to really hear um, the individual bands. Now again, you're gonna have to put your have to put your cans on or listen in a good room to really hear all this stuff. And in fact, I'm going to readjust a couple of these cutoffs. I'm gonna put this down to around minus 120. Now, as I always like to point out, um, we've got a lot of cool presets in here. Presets are great to sort of get you started. Um, I use the broadcast preset a lot, kind of as a as a, as a starting point. Um, there's one here called Pop Master. This tends to make things a little bit bright, um, but not a bad place to start. Uh, you know, and then they have sort of individual settings for actual individual drums. Indie lo-fi is just that. It's a bit more of a grungy, mid-rangey kind of mastered sound. So when you first turn this on, again, it's got all the thresholds and everything preset. You're going to want to adjust those accordingly. Now what's cool about this is you'll notice that you've got separate solo and bypass on each of these. So if I go into solo, All right, now I'm just gonna increase the gain so you can hear that for a second. You know, you can really hear that. So now, obviously we're not gonna go 12 dB of gain on this. I'm just doing that so you can hear it better. But this is now what we have the ability to do. And if you look at the graph here as it was playing, you can see that most of those bass notes fell below 120 hertz or just sort of right on the edge there. So that's good. That's kind of telling us in this range we're really going to be able to amplify or accentuate the attacks of those bass notes just to make it a little bit more thumpy, okay? Now I probably want to do a slightly more aggressive ratio on this. So I'm going to go up to around 6 to 1, all right? And again, we're still sort of compressing here. And what we want to do is let's bring our gain down to 0. We'll set the threshold and then we'll adjust our attack as well, just to kind of make sure that we're getting a little bit more. A one millisecond attack is going to be a bit too quick. We're not quite going to really capture those attacks enough, so we're going to want to speed uh, to slow that down a little bit. So let's take a listen here. Here, I'm actually going to mute my mic so I can do this a little bit better because I'm hearing too much noise too. Now you're really hearing kind of that doo, 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 doo. Okay, that's what we want. We're just kind of adding a little bit of that doo in there. Now, this is the hardest thing to really do. This is also the hardest thing to monitor. So this is why I say when you're working with those uh, bass frequencies, you really need a good listening environment. And particularly for mastering today, where using a subwoofer is so common, it, it's yeah you got you got to have a good listening environment to do this properly otherwise it's very easy to overdo the bass or to you know to not have enough of it and I'm kind of cranking it here remember that when I was setting the output gain you want the gain before compression and after compression to be virtually well you want it to sound the same that tells you that you're compressing it sort of properly then you can add right remember that each uh, each compressor represents an amplification uh, amplification did I just say that? Represents an amplifier as well. So you can adjust the amplification accordingly. But when the effect is on or off, to know that you've set this compressor properly based on your threshold and ratio, of course, 
the volume should be approximately the same okay before you begin again increasing gain or or attenuating so that bass sounds pretty good so now let's take a listen to those uh those low mids So with a ratio of two to one, you can see we're just we're just exceeding it here. Now we with a, a, a one millisecond attack, that means we're basically we're we're kicking that compressor in pretty much all the time. Um, 100 millisecond release, pretty standard there. We could probably make that even a little bit faster. All right, maybe increase that threshold a little bit more. Now bypass. And you notice it's a little bit quieter, right? Because we've attenuated, we've compressed it down. So I'm just going to bring the gain up just a little bit so that it matches with and without the compression. Another half a dB or so. Okay. Now I'm not going to make any final adjustments on the level here until we kind of hear everything all together. So now let's hear those high mids. Now in this band, This is where you can actually get things to kind of breathe and pump a little bit more, to punctuate a little bit more. Again, based on the type of music that you're working on, it's really up to you. And let's go to the high band there. Now for the extreme highs, I tend to do a ratio of around 1.8, all right, with a release around 500 milliseconds, okay? We don't need a lot going on up here. All right, we can actually decrease the gain a little bit there, all right? Are there multiple compressors on this track? Uh, you mean in the original mix? Yeah, I imagine so. There was probably compression on everything, um, certainly on the kick, on the snare. And again, you know, that's what, however the mixer said it, we have no way to change that now, right? So had we, had we uh, been able to go back to the multi-tracks, we could make adjustments, and I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Okay, so now that we've done all of these bands, we've worked with all these bands, okay? Let's take a listen. I'm going to turn the compressor off first, and let's start without it. All right, and now let's kick it in. Oh, wait. It's without. With. Okay. Now we can say, all right, you know what? I think it needs a little bit more of those upper mids. Pull out some of those low mids. Kind of really hear what everything is doing. Okay. Before. After. Now you can hear it's already starting to sound a bit more evened out, right? A bit more homogenized, right? The dynamics are not as present, but the idea is that we're doing this to kind of even everything out. Now when we stop, you'll notice um, we've, have, we've got the brick wall limiting circuitry in here. I'm not going to use the brick wall limiter in this multiband compressor because I'm actually going to use uh, a proper hard limiter or adaptive limiter to do that brick walling for me. You can implement it there, and in theory, that could be sort of the end. If you wanted to stop your mastering with the multiband compressor, you could theoretically do it because we do have this brick wall limiter circuitry. So let's say that I wanted this to be peaking at around minus five. Typically, you want your audio masters for iTunes, Spotify, to be peaking at around minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.7, even minus 0 0.3 for your master. Keep in mind that I showed you before, 
when this gets converted to MP3 or AAC, if you don't leave about half a dB or 0.7 dB of headroom on that finished master, you're going to get a couple transient clip peaks. Now, by the way, um, there are a gazillion songs out there that all exhibit this. So, I mean, I, I would have said before, no, never. Uh, you know, who cares? No one cares. It doesn't actually affect the sound all that much. The newer MP3 and AAC codecs can handle a couple of clipped transients. Um, I don't recommend it still. I recommend mastering to around minus 0.7. Um, but just keep that in mind, that that can happen. But if you wanted to put the, the brick wall limiter on here to actually add loudness to everything, you can do it by adjusting the threshold. So you set your margin. The margin is your ceiling, all right? meaning that the audio will not go any louder than that absolute peak right there of minus 0 0.7. And let's take a listen here and we'll increase that threshold and really kick. Okay, there's nothing. There's width. Okay, so you could stop here, all right? Now, you'll notice that as you add that brick wall limiting, though, you actually now start readjusting the gain relationships of those different bands, okay? You're sort of playing one against the other. Well, we're going to do that, but instead we're going to add one more little thing in here, um, the limiter. Now, before I get there, let me just do this because it was mentioned earlier. Stereo expander, if you wanted to do that, this is a pretty good track to test that on. I'm just going to show you here. Let's start normal and then we'll go wide and just listen to what it's doing, okay? Without. With. Now, see, on this particular track, I actually kind of like a little bit of that stereo expander. I don't mind it. I wouldn't typically use it. I'm going to back it off even more. But it kind of made some of those electric guitars, which are doubled on the left and right, really jump out at the screen. Loudness is subjective. Decibels are objective. Absolutely true. So, um, you know, so with stereo expansion, as you heard and was seen in the chat moments ago, it, 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 yeah, it's a season to taste kind of effect. And... 99.6% of the time, I never use it, but um, it can it can produce some nice effects, um, and sort of give you uh, uh, give you uh, just a bigger sound. You know, the way most things are mixed anyway. Generally today, we kind of take care of that in the mix. Um, okay, all right. So now that we've got that in there, and we, again, these are all running non-destructively, so we haven't processed anything. This is all just in our effects chain. Let's go ahead and grab, and I will go to one of my third-party ones. Now, just on that, as I showed you, you could use the brick wall limiter in the multiband compressor. You also have the hard limiter here in Audition. So this is our native brick wall ceiling limiter where we could say, again, minus 0 0.5 input boost. Okay, let's not put that at 30. <laughs> um, but we could do the same thing here if I just wind back and play, we can start increasing the input here, and this will allow us to kind of amplify everything. Here, we can even go to True Peak if we want. Without. Okay, I mean, that doesn't sound great to me, but you get the idea. So now, also, this one has a very different sound compared to the other one. So, you know, they will all sound a little bit different, all right? I'm going to use, for this, my current favorite. I really have two favorites. Uh, one is um, the new gen ISL2, okay? True Peak Limiter. They even have presets here, again starting point to get you started for things like iTunes. 
uh, and Spotify. And you can start with something like, let's say, 6 dB of gain. Let's take a listen to this. Without. Without. With. Now let's put that stereo expander in there. See, once you've got a good limiter on the end, that stereo expander, now you can actually hear like it's getting, it's getting noisy. Like it's, it's, it's too much because that center, you're messing around with the phase. So this is, you gotta be so careful with stereo expanders. Um, I'm going to remove it because it's just, it's not, it's not making the sound better for me. All right. And again, we can kind of keep listening here. So, no mastering. It's the original mix. Without. All right. You can really hear that. You can see it on the graph here. It's really holding those bass notes down. Right? So that, in essence, is sort of the chain of what you would use uh, to perform mastering on your tracks. Now, as I mentioned before, there is still the idea of, well, what if I just want to tweak the EQ a little bit more? Maybe the mid-range now was sounding a little crunchy or maybe a little too compressed. Well, again, you can always go back while it's playing and adjust those balances, adjust those relationships um, anywhere in the chain here, right? So I could turn this off altogether. Sounds better. No mastering. Mastering. If you're not moving, you're not doing it right. Mm, 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 mm. Dig. Getting all sweaty just listening to it. That, my friends is a very brief tutorial. Not so brief, I talked for an hour and showed you three things. Uh, on mastering. Now we're not done yet, because I always make these go a little bit longer than an hour, even though theoretically, 9.59, I hit it right on the nose. But I did want to show you just a couple of different examples of how you can kind of make things sound a little bit different. Uh, and again, um, just change the overall look. You know, give, give your audio a facelift. Now, I wanted to just show you uh, a couple. Oh, so by the way, so that this is, um, you, you just heard, we're just kind of doing master. This is my actual final master. Uh, oh, whoops. This is the final master that I actually created that will be distributed. So let's go ahead and run our amplitude statistics here. Okay. So you can see now this one I actually uh, exported to minus 0 0.3 because, again, this is pretty standard today. Uh, maximum RMS amplitude minus 6. That's really nice and hot. We're at 16 bit. Again, you can see our true peak here is above zero, but we have no clipped samples. We're not worried about broadcast TV, so that really doesn't matter so much. Uh, minus seven LUFS, nice, hot, thick, big. Here's what it sounds like. And here's the original here, and I'll turn off what we just kind of put on there. Here's the original. All right, and here is my carefully mastered <laughs> version. Go to sleep tonight, 
don't you know that I ain't sleepy? I just want to stay up till dawn. Crack the case. All right. So again, a lot of that compression that's happening there in those lower mids to really bring out that pow, pow of the snare and the do, 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 do of the acoustic bass and also maintain the vocals kind of clear and in the center without being too bright. There's a lot of stuff going on in that mid-range there. So a little bit more careful listening, careful compression, careful A being against different speakers. That's how you achieve that sound. Rulu, even you can tell the huge difference. Oh, right. <laughs> the original sucks. But no, that's see, but that's it. A, a mix. And let me, I'll say this before, because I, I want to just, I don't want to go more than 10 minutes over. An original mix should be, it, it's not going to sound, it's not going to sound like something you'd listen to on Spotify. That's the idea. That's why mastering exists. Um, so, you know, and here, I'll give you, here's another one. So this is the, uh, this is another tune called Sweet Mental Revenge. Again, it's a little, a little warm for my taste. Okay, but we were able to turn it into this. Here's another one. This is called, it's called Purgatory Breakdown. <laughs> kind of an old school rock and roll. Chip is amazing. Chip is an amazing uh, musician and writer. Very influenced by Beatles and Buddy Holly. All right. So here's the master. Right, like. Sounds like, I think I actually use a little stereo expander there because you can hear that that, that -da -da rhythm guitar on the left channel, it really just jumps out at you, you know? And that's what you want to do. That's what you want mastering to do. Now, many, many of my audio files might be looking at this waveform and right now they're going, blah, 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 blah. and you know, the truth is, at, at my core, I feel you. I do. But, hey, you know, it's 2016 and... You know, we like our audio files kind of bricked. So, and because, again, as you're listening, among other things, in Spotify, in Pandora, in Apple Music, you know, if this isn't kind of like this, there's going to be this pretty noticeable, massive drop. And, you know, they track listener habits, and that's when people either, you know, change the tune or, or change the artist. And you don't want that, you know. So, um, so that's it. Okay, so two little quick uh, examples here of diff just a different style uh, of material. So I wanted to show you this because this is no vocal, but um, all in uh, just instruments. All right, so I'm just going to highlight a section here. This is uh, a new tune by my um, oft collaborator, Mr. Fred Fung. I'm going to copy this to a new file and just do a little fade in on the beginning here and let you hear what this sounds like and kind of give you an idea of you know what I might do to master this one. Okay, so we'll run amplitude statistics on this. The loudness war intensifies. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Jason, the master masterer, thank you. All right. Yeah, the original seems so muffled in comparison. It's like night and day. And again, they're they're not actually muffled. They're I mean, they're they're what a mix should be. It's going to be a little warmer. It's not going to have so much brightness in top end because that's what you do in mastering, you know? Now, that's not to say that you can't have bright, crispy mixes too. Um typical typical mixes will be that. They're going to when you AB them, they're like, "Oh god, that was terrible." That's also part of the magic. That's part of the mastery of mastering. And that is part of the, as I said at the very beginning, part of the art form, all right? It's very easy to take something and just make it loud, but not sound better, right? It's not quite so easy, but easy to achieve, if you know what you're doing, the ability to take something that sounded like those originals and just make it a little bit louder, a little bit wider, a little bit brighter, clearer, and just a little bit more present. And that's really what you're trying to achieve. So as we listen to this, again, this one has a very nice characteristic. It's a bit warm. Now, I know, because I know the guy who recorded this, he uses tons of multiband compression. 
So I'm not even going to uh, I'm not even going to attempt that here because he's got a lot on there. But I am going to do a little equalization here to kind of pull out a bit of that warmth that I just I don't really want before I add some of my limiting. See, we're still hearing all the attacks of those drums, but we just pulled out a little bit of that, a little bit of that upper muddiness. Now, if we do around 4K, it just gives us a little bit of what I call the rubber sole lift. See, like we could do that, but we don't, we don't need that much we'll get some of that when we limit. Okay, so here's without EQ. It just opens up a little bit, right? Now let's go into something like this. So this is our multi-band, multi-maximizer. This is not a, our, this is a, a VST from Waves. Just to kind of show you, again, not bad to always start with things like presets. I've got one in here, hot and pumpy. And then you've got your individual bands. And you can see the cutoffs here. Now this is a five, this is a five band. Look, I'm, I'm just adjusting basically the thresholds and the priority in the game and letting the preset do the rest here. All right, so here's without. Okay, here's with, ready? Sounds so flat and lifeless. Boom. Okay, that's actually pretty good. I may have to may have to <laughs> apply that later. Okay, so that again is just something that's you know that's not even that's just a, a totally different style of music. No vocals, very slow. But you can hear we're really accentuating a lot of those different frequencies. All right. So if I were to apply this now, and again because these are all on this non-destructive chain, go ahead and apply this you will see that it gives us that nice, fat, bricky, finished look that we expect. And this is where we run amplitude statistics. Now again, you can see here the previous peak amplitude, it was around minus four, all right? Minus 18 for our total loudness measured in LUFS. Maximum RMS around minus 12. Go ahead and rescan this now. Holy crap, okay, so now, <laughs> I just said the maximum R mass was minus 12. Now minus three, all right, it's crazy loud. Uh, minus 10 LUFS, that's legit. That could actually be pumped up a little bit more. That's because we actually have a lot of dynamic drops in here where things get quite quiet. So we could probably adjust a bit more of that upper mid-range compression, multiband compression, to make these even just more evened out, right, in the quieter sections. This is another common thing that you'll do often with, uh, there's a couple of plugins out there, DJ Cutman and I were talking about this, Max Volume is one of them, and also you just saw me using the L3 multi-maximizer. Um, the previous L2, you can use them in combination or together uh, with Max Volume and really get this like super pumping kind of bass and then have that mid-range also, not pump, but just always always be popped to the front, right? So it's really just, it's very carefully, dynamically limiting and kind of bringing up all the elements. So there really is never any quiet. 
again, you know, musically, stylistically, that may not be your thing, but it keeps it keeps the listener engaged, right? And that is a fact. That that's an absolute there. It does. You don't lose interest when your brain is constantly hearing that sort of continuous sound. All right, and that sounds perfectly loud, but here it is without those effects applied. And here it is with. All right, nice. Okay, and I think, friends, I think that's, uh, I think that's enough. I'll play here one more of Chips, uh, just because this one was actually a pretty dramatic tune. You can see a lot of different transient peaks here that we were able, that I didn't even tame ahead of time because there were just a lot of them. So I just let the compression, the multiband compression do the work. But here's the before mastering. All right, and here's the after. And I complete 11. Oh, no way. All right. So that is, again, the new record coming out soon by Chip Hanna and the Berlin Three on Buddha Jew Music Records. I am Jason Levine, a.k.a. Beetlejays. Please follow me here, twitch.tv slash Beetlejays for more audio, video, and other stuff. Thank you so much for joining me for this very special um, Audio 101 Part 13, How to Master Your Mixes, Mastering Workflow Tips and such. And I will see you in just a few seconds.